good evening to the honorable speakers honorable moderator and all the participants we are going to start today's seminar title leather facts with three most dignified and knowledgeable speakers followed by panel discussion moderation and question and answer session by our renowned member and very good academicist dr buddhadev charanji we request all participants to keep yourself in off mode of sound and video throughout the program during question and answer session kindly raise your hand through chat or raise the questions through chat so that moderator can unmute you when required the session will continue for approximately one and a half hour we request you to give a patient hearing and help us to complete the event smoothly and effectively to start with i request our honorable president mr arnav ja to welcome the honorable speakers moderator and the participants mr ja please good evening mr shushant mallik general secretary iita mr shubir dotto coordinator seminar sub committee dr dietic tech mayor panelist speaker mr safi gamed panelist speaker dr kg sriram panelist speaker dr buddha chatopadhyay moderator members colleagues students and all participants i on behalf of iit welcome you all to join the webinar titled leather facts for information to public and to the advantage of the industry leather this unique word creates a special feeling and is delivered from natural origin as by product of the agriculture industry for quite some years non leathers are used as substitute or alternate in different names like home leather synthetic leather man made leather leatherite ultra suede pure leather etc interestingly the impact comes from the word leather and lot of people get confused and nowadays sporadically some negative propaganda has started damaging leather during the cart and resin program of last iwl tcs congress in india in the hall triple helix in chennai during my <clears throat> deliberation i suggested for introducing some special marks for leather like hall mark for gold and silk mark for silkboard with global acceptance and with all probable legal bindings in the same program mr safi gamed while pressing his celebration endorsed my view it is important to note that during the last iwltcs iue environmental commission meeting on 25th june 2019 in dresden germany dr kg sridam placed and recorded a proposal to prepare a new draft documents on sustainability and best available practices i would request to draw and finally for documentation on each segment starting from food chain to decomposition of products etc leather naturally is trying to push the image of leather for young people <clears throat> so that they choose leather it has now become the observer member of iwltcs the legal aspects of the use of word leather is to describe materials and labeling the new iso standard iso 15115 2019 leather vocabulary now includes animal origin in definition of leather now the time has come we have to establish from all possible corners that leather cannot be replaced or substituted and for this we all from leather fraternity have to join together in different forum and reach all people globally because consumer is the last word for all commodity keeping all this in view our seminar sub committee headed by mr shubhir datta along with sub members have drawn this program leather facts endeavor will be interesting to you all and with this i once again welcome you all thank you now i request mr shubhir datta to take over the charge of the program ahead thank you mr annab ja 
for an appropriate introduction and just as mr jha said that this had been an ongoing discussion between myself my team mr rajesh mr medhi mr asit kanungu and mr anup jha and we are discussing that how we can counter this negative propaganda of certain factions and we felt that actual facts like what are the effects of carbon footprints or the global warming should be made aware of and for this reason this webinar was conceptualized and today we have with us three expert speakers uh, who are also passionate on this issue first speaker is dr dietrich mat dr tegmar is vice president industry relations and global product development trusting business of business unit leather at langses he has also been the former president of iults he will be de deliberating on the leather visa vis imitation and its ecological impact mr tagmar please yeah hello everybody it's a great pleasure for me <clears throat> to talk to all of you last time i gave a presentation it was at clri here you see in the back still some some appreciations i got and you see i have it in my room as a memory and uh, um, okay in the corona times uh, we have to look for other ways and um, therefore i believe <laughs> um, it's a good thing here um, to do this webinar um, i was asked to um, talk about i will share my screen now i was asked to talk about um, <coughs> a presentation which i put together recently um, and uh, which i have given already um, a few times and where i believe it is um, something everybody should know from the industry also from our customers and also also from companies who are working with leather because um, as you <coughs> already um, um, introduced mr ja sustainability and leather yeah very often is mentioned uh, um, um, in a way um, that it looks like it's a contradiction yeah and um, <coughs> a lot of you <coughs> know that this is not true and uh, why i would like to um, to go through in my presentation why i believe it's not true and um, for most of you may i'm sure one or the other topic it's not new but maybe the wording and some facts uh, which i'm going to present uh, are new because we all have to pass on the message to consumers and to everywhere in the world so leather and sustainability <coughs> sorry um is it a contradiction i will um focus on six points uh, where i believe um, the, um, the the topic sustainability is playing an important role first it's a raw material origin yeah the the, the collagen and um, then secondly it's the chemicals which are used and third um, it's the water water consumption <coughs> sorry <coughs> it will it will go away and um the number 4 is um the byproduct um and um number 5 carbon footprint as already mentioned in the beginning and um then also a big advantage leather has compared to other materials is the biodegradability so these are for me the six most important items where um yeah where we need to see to make the leather making process really um sustainable <clears throat> starting with the first raw material origin <coughs> collagen um is made um it's a yeah it's a climate neutral material and here this term climate neutral i really would like to ask everyone to to remember yeah for all this will become the buzzword in the next 5 to 10 years at least in the automotive industry and fashion industry everyone wants to become as soon as possible climate neutral and here we in the leather industry we have a huge advantage why because the hide of course comes from the cow or from a cattle <coughs> a cattle 
is 100% vegan. Yeah, it only eats grass. It has a <coughs> it has a capability to turn grass into proteins. Yeah, and it's eating only grass. And the grass actually is only produced out of CO2, out of water and sunlight by photosynthesis. So if a height <coughs> after use somehow gets converted back or degraded back, biodegrades back, it gets turned into the same amount of CO2 as originally it was uh, generated. So this is the circle, as you can see here, and the whole circle means it is carbon neutral, it's CO2 neutral, yeah? <coughs> and the natural law behind all of this is the conversion of mass. Everybody uh, learns it in the first semester at the university. So each CO2 molecule, which forms the grass, gets eaten by the cow, converts <coughs> into the hide, and gets back released into CO2 after biodegradation. It's the same amount um, as it was uh, um, started. <coughs> Excuse me, it will go back. This is very much different to synthetics. Yeah? Synthetics are made out of uh, oil. Yeah? And uh, this oil is since millions of years in, um, in, the, um, in the earth. It's a carbon sink, actually. Yeah? And um, this oil is converted into the organic chemistry where the synthetics are made of. And after incineration or after um, degradation, if the synthetics are not ending up in the ocean, which is even worse, yeah, they are converted into CO2 plus. That means this is additional CO2 in the atmosphere. And this is not carbon neutral. Actually, it's the opposite. <coughs> and here, <coughs> this is something I really would like to, to have everyone understood. And we have a huge advantage in the leather industry, yeah, because collagen is a carbon neutral raw material base. Yeah? And, and um, from this point of view, from a sustainability point of view here, we have a huge advantage and we can market with a green dot. <coughs> Let me come to the second topic, chemicals, yeah? We all know chemicals are playing a very important role in the leather manufacturing, yeah? Chemicals prepare and turn the hide into the durable material leather, which is called tanning. Chemicals are providing um, the leather, the character by filling and softening and dyeing. Chemicals generate a value because <coughs> we can um, increase the cutting yield due to smart chemistry in the finishing side. And <coughs> very important for, um, for automotive applications, chemicals guarantee also the technical performance, abrasion, um, 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 anti-soiling, clean, uh, cleanability, and so on. This is all done by chemicals. You, so you can say, uh, without chemicals, the leather industry uh, um, can't work. Yeah, no chemicals, no leather. So, but there are different types of chemicals. If I think back 20 years ago, where our knowledge about um, yeah poisonous harmfulness uh, uh, was completely different to that what it was today. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, um, the chemistry was very much different. So in the meantime, the chemical industry has more or less redesigned the portfolio. And we are trying to make them as natural as possible, as harmless as possible. So we use a lot of natural raw materials like enzymes, proteins, waxes, casein, starch, vegetable tannings, cellulose, lignin, zeolite, and so on, minerals. <clears throat> So all this is um, not part of the chemical portfolio in synthetics, yeah. And therefore, I believe here in the chem uh, in the leather industry, we already do a very good job, yeah. And we have a very good portfolio available available to every tenor, even in India, in Bangladesh, or wherever you are. And um, 
those so-called good chemicals <coughs> are listed in the roadmap to zero MRSL from ZDHC. You can download this in the internet if you um, search by Google or something uh, else, uh, ZDHC leather, you will find it. And here all the chemical suppliers are listing their chemicals which are in line with modern standards of um, restrictions. And um, if a tenor is following those type of chemicals um, and purchases from the, um, according to this list, yeah, he can say he is on the safe side uh, uh, using the best portfolio of, of chemicals. So also chemicals for me, if the tenor is sourcing the right products, I think it's something the leather industry has solved with this whitelist for sustainable chemicals because they are audited by ZTHC according to latest standards. The third big topic, which is very, very often uh, um, put in, in wrong picture is the water consumption. Um, because people believe leather is um, using a huge amount of water because uh, leather is produced in big drums like uh, uh, in big washing machines. And um, I, I, I don't see this. This is not fair. Why? If you go in internet, for example, waterfootprint.org. Yeah, that is a so-called scientific platform, um, um, an NGO, which gives for all types of products, a cup of coffee and meat and uh, um, paper and whatever, um, the amount of water which is required to produce this product, yeah? which is a good thing. And um, if you look at this database, for one square meter of leather or one kg of leather, it's around about one square meter, uh, there it stands, 17,000 liter water is used to produce one square meter of leather. I mean, this is an uh, astronomic amount of water, yeah? And um, is this fair? And I would say no. Maybe there is an algorithm which comes to this number, yeah? Uh, um, but if you really look behind, and that's our job in the leather industry to communicate this to our brands and our customers and even to the consumers, this is nonsense, 17,000 liter. Why? A tannery only uses about 100, 200 liter of water per square meter. And this is less than 1% of these 17,000 liters, which are mentioned. 99% of these 17,000 liters uh, is rainwater. Rainwater, which is required, as I mentioned before, in the photosynthesis to grow the grass. And I mean, this is going to happen yeah, regardless if on this uh, grass field uh, um, there is a cow and if the cow is converted uh, into meat and leather and so on, the rainwater is falling, yeah? And so for me, this is not process water, yeah? And that is something we have to make clear to everyone, yeah? Um, the amount of process water is between, as I said, 100 and 250 liter per square meter. And this is not bad. If you look, for example, for a denim jeans, yeah? The process water to produce a denim jeans, yeah, is above 1,000 liter to my knowledge, yeah? So leather is actually one-tenth of this and um, it's, it's, it's a good performance, yeah? And by the way, we are not using water, we are just, I always say, borrowing the water from, uh, from the nature. Very often um, a tannery works in a bypass to a river, yeah? So we take out some water we use it for the leather process and afterwards it has to be cleaned in a wastewater treatment plant and then released. And as you know, very often the clean water has a better uh, um, um, quality than the incoming water. Yeah. So we are not using water. We are just borrowing water for the process. And this is something completely different than uh, what I understand as a use of water, where you really 
take water from the nature and you don't give it back. You understand? So from this point of view, um, these 17,000 liter and the, the, the massive use of water, it is something we really have to uh, um, communicate. This is not the case. From my perspective, the water issue in the, um, in the leather industry isn't an issue. We can minimize even the amount of water, which is good. Yeah. And um, we, uh, uh, we have to clean the water. The only issue the leather industry has with water is salt. Yeah, salt actually is the biggest issue, chemical issue from the leather industry. Think about it. simple salt, you know. And when you are not working at an ocean where the water anyhow has salt, you know, if you're working inland and uh, you have to remove the water into a river, then I can imagine this could be an issue. But there you have to treat then the water with technologies also to separate the salt. And even this is possible. Yeah, so water can be managed, can be controlled, and uh, therefore I also don't see a principal issue, a CAIO criteria for, uh, for leather manufacturing in terms of sustainability. Coming to the next topic, which is also something we in the leather industry uh, are not always uh, addressing this right. And think about if a tenor is buying let's say 10 tons of raw material, raw hides, yeah? And if he sells leather, he only sells about 20 to 30% of the volume which he has purchased. No? The rest are shavings, the rest are splits, the rest are lime leather and all this other stuff, yeah? So 60 to 70% of, uh, um, of the purchased material he's buying actually are byproducts. And if those byproducts get burned or going to waste, which is going to happen in the past and uh, maybe still uh, uh, in many cases today, I really can't consider the leather manufacturing process as sustainable. Yeah? If you use only 20% of what you purchase and the rest is going to waste, to be honest, this is not a sustainable process. And therefore, um, the chemical industry here, my industry, for example, Lanxess, or maybe you have heard in the near future, my new company, TFL, uh, we in the chemical <laughs> industry, we are working um, together with many, many turners, and we are trying to provide them opportunities to even make value out of these byproducts. These byproducts are proteins, proteins. Protein is a, a, a natural high valuable raw material. It's a shame to put these byproducts, uh, um, turn it into waste. Yeah? And you can make um, uh, in cosmetic application, you can use for fertilizer, you can use it for uh, pet food, you can use it for many, many other applications. We are working currently on adhesives. We are working on flame retardants um, um, for the construction industry. There are so many potential um, um, applications for these byproducts, yeah? This is called protein upcycling. And this is a must the leather industry needs to see. The leather, the tanner shouldn't look only on the portion of raw materials, which he turns into leather. He needs to be a recycling industry for the entire proteins he is going to purchase. Yeah, this is a new thinking. Yeah, you can't switch from one day to another. But I can tell you, this is an extremely important aspect for the future. We will come into some kind of we call it uh, in science um, a regenerative era. Yeah, the industry is moving into a regenerative area. Uh, era, era. That means the focus will be on circular economy. It will be on recycling. Yeah. And if we have a mass balance like here, that only one third of the material we are purchasing, we are turning into leather, we are out of the game. So we need to find solutions, sustainable solutions 
um, um, for these byproducts. And here, my company, Lang says, and also uh, many other companies in the leather industry, we try to work together um, that we, in a partnership, can come up with solutions together with the tanning industry. If this is going to happen, no problem. Yeah, we can make a green dot be uh, for the byproduct as well. It's not a sustainability issue. Coming to the next topic, carbon footprint. Yeah, carbon footprint is a KPI, which is used more and more for evaluating um, the efficiency, the energy efficiency of a process. And it's a good KPI. It's very good. The problem is you need to find the right algorithm to, um, to, to generate, to calculate this uh, KPI. And here I would like if, to give you two, ex, uh, uh, two references. One is, um, by the way, you can have this presentation afterwards. Yeah, I will, um, uh, if, you, if you send it out by, by, um, by PDF, it's not an issue for me at all. Um, sustainable benchmarking study of different materials, you will see. And I would like to, um, um, to show you the result of a pilot study we did in the uh, European Union, together with the meat industry, by the way. Yeah. So in Jutta Knödlers, uh, um, um, she's a, a chemical engineer, and, and she got a um, um, research fund to do this study from the German government. And um, she assessed different seed materials by leather, textile, artificial leather, and of course, uh, genuine leather. And she made a so-called cradle to grave analysis. Yeah? She um, investigated all steps, the production of raw materials, the production of chemicals, which the tenor is buying, the transportation, then the, the manufacturing of the synthetic leather or the real leather, the wastewater treatment plan. He, she also took um, a certain amount of use in this case of car, and she was looking for the final disposal. Here, this use is actually something um, you can keep in mind, which is for each material uh, in the same way, as you can see here, it was 5% of a car, which is more or less the weight of the interior. And if you drive then a certain amount of uh, kilometers per annum and um, a certain amount of years, then you can calculate roughly um, how much CO2 equivalent the use of this car leather um, is going to do or the car seat material. Yeah? So you will see this later on here. Yeah, in the next slide, you see um, the investment she did. Oops. And uh, on the left is the PVC and PU, so artificial leather, coated leather. Yeah. And you see if you, for each step, she evaluated how many chemical, uh, how much CO2 equivalent it was uh, uh, generated. And then she sum up to a um, total of 15.8 kg CO2 equivalents per square meter of artificial leather. Yeah? And uh, as I said, uh, um, if you only want to look for the um, fabrication of the material, you have to deduct these 8.1 kg, which comes from the use. Yeah? So we are in a range of 7 kg of CO2 equivalents per square meter artificial leather. If you look for cotton or if you look for polyester nightwear, yeah, uh, uh, woven material, we come up to 18.8 for cotton and 20.6 CO2 equivalents per square meter um, woven polyester material. Yeah? It's a bit more, but it's, let's say, not completely out of the scale. And um, if you, even here, you have to deduct these 8.1 to come to the um, real process um, KPI. So how does it look like uh, um, of leather compared to this 
uh, alternative materials. Even here, we had the chemical production, we have the transportation of wet blue, we have the production of leather in the beam house, in the retaining and in the finishing. We have the wastewater treatment uh, coordinated, again, the 8.1 kg for a life cycle. And because leather is carbon neutral, here we have not an addition, we have a negative impact if we, um, if we convert it, if we thermal, uh, um, put it in a, an incineration because we generate energy, which we can use, which is a negative uh, uh, contribution and we turn it to the same amount of CO2, as I mentioned in the beginning, as it was generated. It's carbon neutral, climate neutral. So then we come up, if we sum it up all, we come up to 7.2 kg, 17.2. So it's in the middle of cotton and PVC. Yeah. And it's even better than polyester woven material. Yeah. So it's actually good. Yeah. So now comes the big question, the cattle farming. Yeah. How is it contributing to the overall carbon footprint. And here, unfortunately, very, very different calculations and algorithms uh, are out and are used. Therefore, you have to be very careful if you get a number for leather, uh, um, um, how it is calculated. And actually, this is not an issue of leather. It is an issue of all natural based materials like paper or um, also cotton, actually, yeah. Um, we do not know where to end the calculation and the allocation of how much of these pharma process gets allocated to leather. And that, that was a study the EU has done. And uh, here you see the result. It's a, a, a 160 pages uh, um, document, but actually this is the core of the document. If a cow yeah, uh, also generates milk, and dairy, yeah, uh, uh, and cheese, uh, where, where you can make cheese and, and something like this out. Yeah? This is more or less, uh, and this is for several years, and of a cow, when it, when it gets slaughtered, now about 88% of the value is going in, is allocated to this uh, milk industry, and only 12% is allocated to the body. And from the body, 96.5% of the weight is the meat, and only 3% is the height. So if you have the 3%, oops, if you have the 3% uh, um, of a body, and, and this is only 12% of the cow, if you calculate this down, it's only 0.42% of the cow, which has to be allocated to, um, to leather. Yeah. And this is a different algorithm as it is used in many, many other calculations, but I believe this is the right one. And if you then, as I mentioned before, 70% of the cow height are byproducts. If you use them for something else, you can allocate out 70% of this carbon footprint to those products and only 30% remains for genuine leather. And this is around about 1.4% of the original 100% of a cow. And if you do this, then you can come up to additional 3 kg out of the cattle farming industry allocated to leather. And if you add those up to 17.2, um, to then you come to an overall um, um, carbon footprint of 20.2 kg. CO2 equivalents per square meter leather. And this is in the same magnitude like um, the synthetic materials. And therefore, we can make even this point of view with a mark this with a green dot. So last but not least, one very, very important argument uh, for leather compared to any other material is the biodegradability. We all know the issues we have in the ocean with synthetic fibers, yeah, that uh, uh, they do not get uh, degraded, yeah, they are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and then at some point of time they are ending up in the stomach of a, a fish, or a whale, or whatever. And um, you will never ever find a piece of leather in a stomach of a whale, for example, because it's degraded before. Yeah, it will never be possible to, to have this directly 
uh, um, in the ocean and uh, as, a, as a material. So biodegradability is a huge advantage for leather. And uh, I would like to, to um, show you how the science is looking to this topic, biodegradability. Actually, they are differentiating between bio-based origin and biodegradable materials. This is something different. Yeah, I will, uh, I will show you. And there you can have the biodegradability, yes or no, which is here on the X scale. And you can have um, bio-based origin or not. Fossil-based is on, the, on, on this scale and bio-based origin, renewable origin is on the Y scale in the top. So now you can have four different types of materials. First, you have synthetic polymers polyester, PVC, PU, yeah? They are, on one hand, based on a fossil raw material source, and they are not biodegradable. It's a no-go for the future, yeah? Therefore, I put it in red. Then we have materials. The BASF is working very hard on this, yeah? Uh, and these are materials which are bio-based, yes, um, but which, uh, um, which do not, uh, um, yeah, which, which are um, um, biodegradable, so I have to say, yeah, but which are still based on, on fossil source, yeah, caprolactam, and so there are certain polymers which can biodegrade, which is good if they end up in the nature, they will not end up in the stomach of a whale, but they are still based on, uh, on oil. And if you burn them, they are giving additional CO2 to the atmosphere. Yeah? So now I'm back. And then is the third group. Um, they are based on renewable raw materials, which is good, but they get chemically modified. And if they go in the nature, they are not biodegrading anymore because they are chemical modi chemically modified. Also not good. And the, uh, the nicest material and the future material from sustainability point of view, yeah, these are bio-based polymers, which even can biodegrade. And um, this is our collagen, our leather, also cotton, yeah. And most of the chemicals we are using, like veg tans, as I mentioned before, they are also bio-based, yeah. So we have a bio based material, which is even um, um, degrading in the nature and uh, going back to the same amount of CO2 as it was uh, uh, generated from the beginning. And this is a huge advantage of real leather yeah, uh, compared to um, synthetics. Of course, in finishing and in retaining synthans, for example, we are also using chemicals which are deriving from a fossil source. That's why we are not 100% bio-based, but at least we are 80, 90, maybe 70. It depends on the recipe. We are bio-based. Yeah? For Schuapa leather, where you use a casein wax, yeah? um, we will be maybe even above 90%. So um, this is a big advantage and the big difference between leather and um, yeah, artificial materials. Yeah, if you um, sum up then this chart, what I, uh, what I did, even in biodegradability, we can give for leather a green dot, but for synthetics, this definitely would be a red dot. Yeah, then I'm coming already to my end. Yeah, these were the most important six parameters of, uh, from a sustainability point of view, raw material origin, chemicals, water, byproducts, carbon footprint, biodegradability. We have for everything a, a solution. Yeah? The best available technology, which is available to every tenor in the world, yeah? um, um, can make sure that leather can be, um, is proven to be safe in use. It's harmless for environment and human health. And um, of course, leather has these huge advantages that it is uh, um, sourced from a safe and audited production process um, and it is a renewable raw material. And um, yeah, 
um, safe and audited process we have also in, in manufacturing. If you, you everyone knows, I guess, uh, um, the Leather Working Group, which audits a um, tannery process um, from an environmental point of view. And we have this uh, ZDHC uh, uh, NGO, which uh, uh, takes uh, uh, chemicals uh, side of use and um, make sure that the chemicals are okay. Yeah, and then we have these huge advantages that um, advantage that leather is also a renewable and biodegradable material. So for me, if, if all this is in place, yeah, if we have a um, if we have a state of the art production in the leather industry and a good sourcing in the tannery, for me, the use of leather is the ultimate sustainable choice of material, and this is a message we have to bring out all we all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tigmat, for a very detailed discussions and updated information. Uh, we'll come back, back to you during the question and answer session. Uh, second expert in our panel today is Mr. N. Shafiq Ahmed. Mr. N. Shafiq Ahmed is the partner and MD of the Shafiq Shamil and Company, a 50 plus years group. He is a leather and footwear technologist from IIT CLI Chennai with professional training abroad in Europe and USA. Mr. Shafiq has industry experience for more than 30 years and served as CUA member of the CLE for more than 10 years. He has been president South India Shoe Manufacturers Association and chairman ISO TC120 Leather Committee. Mr. Shafiq Ahmed was also former chairman IFLIMIA President ISF and Vice Chairman CLE. Eco-sustainability of leather industry in long term is a special interest of Mr. Shafiq. We will also be deliberating on the topic leather vis-a-vis -vis, uh, imitations in the Indian perspective. Mr. Shafiq Ahmed, please. Yeah. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for having me today and uh, giving this opportunity to interact uh, with the, the learned people here, Dr. Uh, Ed Mayer and Dr. Sriram. They are the industry experts. Um, I mean, sorry, the domain experts. I am coming from the industry. I would add, the, I, I would like to add the industry perspective, where we stand, how we compare to uh, the uh, industries in Europe who have gone forward, like uh, what Mr. Ted Mayer has said. Uh, it's no doubt, uh, he has explained very clearly vis-a-vis the, -vis the leather advantage of leather, the circular economy, that leather can come out with the circular economy because it's recycles, it reuses, and uh, in the end, it is a biodegradable product. Uh, that's, that's coming to a very good conclusion, and very soon in Europe, they would probably catch up with, uh, catch up with this situation, and the awareness for leather is being generated there and is spread over to the public and in general. Even under the UN program, the, the UN leather has been, leather has been, uh, leather has joined uh, to save the, what you call the, uh, the eco, eco sustainability, one of the initiatives. And I think the uh, top brands in Europe, the topmost brands have joined together in hands and they are coming out with the leather as a, uh, what you call sustainable fashion product, which is all happening good here. I was asked to say the Indian perspective of this. So it's very difficult to put where we stand in this uh, situation now. And uh, from my side, I would say that we are still in India, we, is, we are largely in a catch up position to this status, what uh, Mr. Ted Mayer has said and what's happening in Europe. And uh, though Though leather, as, as such stands, a very good product of uh, circular, circular processing, circular economy, we still have a large um, awareness shortage, awareness gap. We have, um, we have a lot of uh, ignorance and misinformation about leather, uh, which, which has to be corrected for the goodness of leather, what we have now. So the, we got a wrong fact sheet here. I have discussed this many times with Dr. Sriram. The fact sheet in India has to be corrected by way of awareness program and uh, by use of 
uh, various other term, various other means. I have even discussed about how we could be doing the right branding for leather in India, and uh, we we should come out with something like a legislative points also, like like Europe has, like Italy has done recently, where they have come out with a legislative degree on uh, a law to form to misuse of leather term. The term leather could not be used with any other products except animal origin. And we should also look at the possibility of bringing the, like the, the sort of EU directive for using the right information on the leather products, which is the symbols and the information on the products, which has the EU uh, directives there to cover that apart from the misuse of leather, which is being restricted in Italy now. So uh, the Indian perspective, I would say the tanning industry in India is, is in the middle of this total misinformation in the retail, I would say in the retail industry. One be in the export sector, we face the uh, use of excessive use of synthetics, uh, non-leathers, imitations, but uh, uh, which is in which is under check, like like Dr. Uh, Ted Mayer has said, which is under check. We we expect we expect that to very soon take over uh, for the right information. As far as the Indian market uh, Indian uh, market is concerned. I have just mentioned we need to put in places where is whatever is required to bring this uh, awareness or uh, in, under under the control of law and everything. There is no doubt that uh, uh, leather in India has been a very very old product, probably much much historically older than any of the world markets, and uh, we had always had leather connected to the rural economy, the rural artisan. Then it moved on to the small scale industries. Then once the uh, industrialization took over, the, we have seen how the non-leather and the imitations have taken over the market. First, it was for the price points that the synthetics were introduced uh, for certain price points, but now it has taken over all, all, all the price points and leather as an industry Leather is uh, mar uh, in some way so in, in large in many of the places it is marginalized as a as a very marginal products in the retail market that suffers that gives this has been a, a shortcoming in the leather industry. Leather industry feels that a synthetic should stand on its own uh, with the right marking, with the right uh, uh, product information, and leather for all its uh, goodness and uh, 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 differentiation should stand for, for proper symbolic marking and everything so that it is uh, as a luxury product, as a traditional product which India has always cherished leather, right, historically, uh, it should go and it should be, it should be recognized in that part. We do, uh, I do not see the socio-cultural aspects in India because India is a very diverse society and there's a lot of contradictions and the the amount of uh, uh, leather non-users are very, very small in, in when it comes to products. And uh, traditionally, which, which, we, which we are not worried about, and we had to look for how to spread the, uh, the right usage of leather in the Indian uh, uh, usage, especially in the retail and also, also in the uh, export sector. That's probably my standpoint from the industry standpoint. And I think sustainable, sustainability and the circular economy, circular product is well explained by Dr. Ted Mayer. And uh, I would uh, uh, like to conclude in today's meeting, today's this interaction that what action plan we, we need to have in the Indian leather sector? How are we going to protect the Indian tanneries? Because we, we know there's a large number of Indian tanneries are there. I have been uh, working on the data of how much tanneries are filled up now, how many tanneries are going empty with no leather businesses. And uh, this has been one of my uh, aspects in uh, highlighting to the um, Council for Leather Exports and all that. And so we have to find out how much of this terminology point and the uh, uh, identification of leather and non-leather products, how much that could help the, help the industry to revive ourselves, uh, 
because Indian, India is a growing economy and it's a growing uh, purchasing power economy. And this is the right time that we introduce leather awareness to the youngsters, especially who are not uh, aware of leather, who are misinformed correctly. Currently, they are misinformed like anywhere else. And uh, the right information about the sustainability of the leather has to be introduced into Indian market. I'm, we have just initiated a work on this with uh, CLRA. CLRA has come forward and taken a responsibility to how to bring this about in the near future. And uh, uh, from the Indian perspective, uh, this is what I would say the, the immediate task, the task will be. But the uh, sustainability points, what Mr. Ted Mayer has said, is very much applies to all the Indian tanning sector uh, to bring a circular processing. He has said the, uh, the entire sustainability processing, which, which can be a, a, a circular economy. I think we should, the Indian tanning sector should immediately work on those lines uh, together with partnering with CLRA. And uh, this could be my observation currently from my standpoint. Uh, I would like to, to hand it over to the moderator right now. For, I'm, I'm open to any questions after this from the, from the standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shafi Ahmed. Yes. And I will also request you to be present for our question and answer sessions. Sure. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and taking your uh, uh, discussions forward on the legislation part, I would invite Dr. K.J. Sriram, who is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry UK and Society of Leather Technologies and Chemists UK, is the director of the CSI CLRI. Institute since December 2019. Prior to this, he was the head of the testing facilities of the Institute, where his contributions towards development of test methods for leather and allied products and achieving the ISO 1702520171 standards were highly acclaimed. Dr. Siram is the recipient of CSIR Young Scientist Award in 2004 for his contributions to green chemistry of chromium. Dr. Sridham has developed a range of functionalized metal and metal oxide nanoparticles with potential applications in cross-linking of proteins, <coughs> a work which led is being recognized by the International Union of Leather Technologies and Chemist Societies with the International Union of Research Award. Dr. Sridham has an impressive publication record with 96 papers in national and international journals. 1666 citations and H index of 21. He also has 19 patents filed to his credit with several technology transfer consultancy activities. Dr. Sridham has also been involved in science communication, especially in the area of sustainable manufacturing. In his role as the director of CSIR, CLRI, he is also the chairman of the CHT 17 of the Bureau of Indian Standards and the member of the Council of Administration, Satra Coimbatore and the Governing Council of FDDDI. Dr. Sridham, I request you to please give your presentation. Good evening to all of you and uh, thanks very much to ILTA, Dr. Tekmar, Mr. Shafiq Ahmed, uh, and all those who share the same thought process uh, when it comes to leather. Uh, I was to talk about certification of leather and the present scenario in the legislation side. When I started looking for what do you mean by this term called certification and uh, what can we talk about here, I came and started looking at what is there in the rest of the areas of the industry, uh, rest of the areas of the industry worldwide. And I happened to look at the first thing that which I wanted to look at, what is a fiber? So when we went and looked at what is a fiber, and uh, we, I come back and uh, find, found that there are several terminologies that people are misusing or using and all that stuff. And finally, but not the least, the fiber is a morphological term characterized for its flexibility, fineness, high ratio of length to uh, the... Uh, uh, length through the cross-sectional area and those kind of things. Uh, so now having said this, I was just looking at 
the next thing, what should we be calling as a fiber? Now, there can be two types of fibers, the man-made fibers and the natural fibers. Again, here, the man-made ones are divided into organic and inorganics. The organics can further be divided as those which are naturally polymer transformed, synthetic polymer transformed, and so on and so forth. But in the whole concept of thing, the natural fiber is very, very limited. So therefore, we have to go back and keep this terminology in mind. And then comes what Mr. Shafiq Ahmed was pointing out about the terminology of the term called leather. In 2019, the Indian Standard, uh, the International Standards Organization, the ISO, uh, put up the terminologies for leather, and they came back and said, hide or skin with its original fibrous structure, more or less intact, tan to be imputrisible, but the hair or wool may or may not have been removed, whether or not the hide or skin is split into layers or segmented either before or after tanning and most importantly the surface layer or coating the finishing coating or whatever is not thicker than 0.15 mm this is what the iso has finally finalized for the term called leather now they also give two notings there it said that if the tan hide or skin is mechanically or chemically disintegrated it should not be called as leather. So even the terminology called leather board is not right. If the grain leather has been completely removed, the term leather is to be used with an additional qualification. For instance, it should be called the split leather. So this is where the international standards itself stands. Now, unfortunately, or whatever, these are only voluntary terminologies and we may have to look at what do we want to do in this. So you go back and look at what every country has done and the International Leather Council comes back and says that EU has a labeling mechanism for footwear where 80% of the material that it constitutes has to be indicated as to what that material is all about. It also wants to say that now they are making it more clear, if it contains non-textile parts of animal origin, it has to be very clearly mentioned. Italy, as was being mentioned just now, has also made it very clear as to who can use the terms leather, hide, fur, pele, and all those kind of things. Spain, as early as 1984, you, has banned the use of the leather term by products that have lost the natural structure itself. Now, who have been giving the leather mark? UK ha has been doing it. Italy has been doing it. China has been doing it. Brazil is in the process of initiating it. USA is in the process of initiating it. Japan has just started it. South Africa is doing it. And of course, Spain is doing it. And there are several other countries in the European Union you have, who have aligned with Italy and through the UNIC are giving the leather mark. Now, this is where we want, we were starting, Mr. Arnabja was talking about a leather mark like the hallmark for India. And this is what I was told to speak about also. Now, before I do that, I go back to what uh, Dr. Tekmer left about. And this is one aspect which we will have to be very careful. On one side could be the legislations, one side could be the ISOs, one side could be the leather mark we give and all that stuff. But we also have to go back and look at from the back of our mind, why is it that people are going towards the synthetics? A, are the synthetics making the people feel that leather is not good while synthetics are? This is one area of thought. Second possibility is that the synthetics are being sold at a cheaper price than the leather without certain concerns or advantages that the leather would give compared to the synthetics. So when I went to the unique website, the Italian website, and I found a very clear statement there, real leather is real sustainability. And they went back and said that unique is aiming at end consumers and focused on the main characteristics, naturalness, circularity, 
durability and creativity and they go back and in all their advertisements in all their features come back and say that look it is that naturalness and the circularity and durability which makes leather different from all the rest of the materials i was the, i was so excited by what i saw in the italian uh, uh, forum you know they keep on coming back and telling the people how leather is much much better than anybody else and they keep on stressing the point that leather is a by product of the food industry and you go back and look at the kind of brochures that they have released they keep on saying italian leather is a guarantee of the highest levels of transparency and our commitment they also go back and say it's a formidable model of a compliance with the highest safety standards that protect even the end consumer now indian leather has to have its own trademark not just by giving a hallmark of it but also on the aspects of sustainability when we go back and really look at it you would find in the literature itself that one of the countries who started using enzymes in the place of lime and sulfide for leather processing was india one of the countries or possibly currently a very few number of countries who in the almost like 30 years back started looking at sodium chloride nacl the total dissolved solids and made sure that we are compliant to the tds norms which were very unique to certain states of this country is also being addressed is indeed now these are the things which have not got highlighted sufficiently enough in the whole process by which this industry handles leather i was kind of little bit perplexed when yesterday i saw a brochure which has come out uh, in the forum and it says that synthetic footwear is a green industry i today's presentation of dr techmat very clearly tells us how the synthetics is not a green industry i was trying to go back and find out from where did they pick up this cold stuff and i found that in one of our uh, norms we have said that leather is in the red category while leather footwear is in the green category and they picked up from there and went on to say non leather footwear is also a green category industry because we don't use water now this is where uh, what dr techman just said about the water consumption is being unnecessarily highlighted in a different fashion and possibly many of us in our research publications etc have also been highlighting that the water consumption of the leather industry is much worse than paper industry that industry etc while we are not actually so and it also is in one way we should highlight here that iultc is also was at one point of time stressing that people should not say in their publications or terminologies chromium is toxic this is where exactly where we have to start focusing on the industry whichever industry is doing very well on the sustainability point of view should stand together and focus very well i give you an example once again from the italian standpoint itself the e uni en 16484 talks about requirements for the determination of the origin of leather production they come back and say that you have to define a leather as italian now not just the definition or leather mark it even says italian leather and in they say that if if you are tanning substantial tanning has to happen in italy if it is a crust substantial transformation that is retaining fatigue dyeing has to happen in italy in the case of finnish leather origin of the finnish leather shall be the country where retaining was done and the finishing happens in a different country that is it should be marked as italian leather finished in france or french leather finished in italy so they are now even started going to the next level of not just tagging the leather but also saying 
that this is Italian leather. Now, go back and look at it. They also have the logos for that. The tanneries can have a four leather made in Italy or four leather full cycle, which means the entire process, entire thing is done in Italy itself. Now, when we have a growing leather market, a low growing market, domestic market in the country, at the present moment, we are almost like 50-50 domestic versus international market. We must start focusing on these things and make sure that we are in a position to claim the better part of leather. What has CLR done till now on the leather mark or the, uh, is, is what we need to look at. What we thought was that let us have an iterative technique. We thought that we will have a, as much as possible a non-destructive methodology so that even a consumer uh, based outlet, the guy or the, the guy who's selling the material can showcase through a very small equipment worth a few lakhs whether the material given is leather or non-leather. And we tried catching up on the protein, which is very, very unique to us, the collagen. And we knew that the collagen has specific amide bonds, which can be easily picked up on the FTIR. We went and picked up about a thousand samples uh, from various fairs and so on, which have been marked as leather, as various names of synthetic leather, that etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and people who were selling synthetics as leather. And we found that except in a few cases, wherein the leather or the, the leather has been used leather has been repurposed. The collagen has been taken out and mixed with the uh, polymers and created a board kind of material. The FTIR technique would be used as a screening technique for identification of leather. Today, you get handheld FTIRs for as less as three to four lakhs or five lakhs in this country. Then comes the next level in case you have a doubt to go into the microscopic techniques or even we found that when somebody does a thermogravimetric analysis, burn the material and check, which we used to do in the as a preliminary technique, we found that even the pattern by which the leather would degrade, Dr. Tekmeyer was talking about the biodegradability is totally different from the synthetics point of view. Finally, but not the least, the hydroxyproline content itself, how much of hydroxyproline is there is very unique to the leather. If it is not mixed with anything else, you know that there is a definite value of uh, hydroxyproline depending upon the kind of animal that, with which the leather has been made. So this is something which we were talking about as a way to go for to do the leather mark. But the question comes, how do we do this in the industry level? So you go back and look at how the gold marking is done. They look at homogeneity, purity, and marking individual items. This is where our challenge starts. Gold, you can go uh, the entire ornaments or thing in a jewelry shop can be marked individually. How do you do this when it comes to leather? In, especially in India, we have to see how does a testing agency or anybody is in a position to mark the entire lot or however it is done. So these are some challenges which we may have to work out after which India can have its own leather market. Uh, to conclude, what could be the next steps? I would put the consumer awareness of what is leather in the top. The next thing would be that we need to be transparent and showcase ourselves the eco character of the leather. Then we may have to see that once we are the, have the eco character, how do we convince our governmental systems to move us out of the red category and get ourselves into the green category? Then you do everything, but still some synthetics are there whose costs are so low. We must have to look at can leather still meet the materials on cost? When I say about cost, I need to also highlight to you one art, uh, material, article which I read uh, about three, four months back. One of the European countries about a decade back had replaced leather upholstery with synthetics in their trains. Last year, they re realized that it was a mistake because the synthetic one, they had to change it in a matter of five years for, uh, 
itself, while the leather one, leather upholstery stayed there for more than 25 years. So they have taken a call now to go back to leather upholstery as against the synthetics. This is something which we may all like to talk about when we talk about cost, cost at what sense, not just the right cost what you're buying, but in also in terms of how much more time you can bear it, the durability associated cost and so on and so forth. Finally, but not the least, we have to establish scientifically that leather is more durable and more circular than synthetics. This is a challenge which the Indian leather industry will have to take it forward. And we need to really come back and do everything that was marked in Dr. Tecmeyer's presentation. We cannot throw away our solid waste. We need to make that byproduct utilization. We need to implement the best practices in water management. Otherwise, our carbon dioxide values that uh, was being presented today would be totally on the wrong side. Therefore, I would actually stop by urging the industry that while we would take up the legislative road or whichever as the industry would like to in saying what should be called the leather and what should not be called the leather, we also have to take upon our responsibility to showcase the leather in the right manner. Uh, if not, uh, like some countries that we, I presented, as early as 84, they had the, the, the uh, norms there in place. But it may not just apply or work at all. So these two things have to go hand in hand and thus work for us. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sridhar, for updating us on what needs to be done and how we go about it. Just a point to be noted that in ILTA, this is... Uh, we are not going, it is as a, this webinar is a, not a one-off activity. We want to take this mission forward or this message forward. And if anyone wants to partner with us or we want to partner, want us as the partner, we will be uh, associating with them. So it is, uh, now I would request Dr. Dudhadev Chattavardhai principal of MCKV Institute of Engineering and former principal of Government College of Engineering and Leather Technology to take over the session as the moderator and handle the question and answer session. Dr. Chattavardhai, please. Well, uh, thank you, Shubir. Uh, to sum up, uh, the, we have the three uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Dietrich uh, Tegmeyer, who has spoken on leather vis-a-vis non-leather and uh, say leather sustainability is it a constant contradiction or not now to start with we we came to know that uh, it's a collagen uh, which is the basic material raw material of leather is a climate neutral material and uh, the cattle in fact uh, are the uh, our cattle or any animal produces the skins hides and skins that is used in leather Cattle in turn uh, take the grass uh, and uh, the grass uh, consumes the carbon dioxide and water and to, produce, to photosynthesize to carbohydrate. And this is being uh, used uh, by the cow to ultimately synthesize the protein. So if you take the carbon balance of uh, the cattle and the slaughterhouse and the farming vis-a-vis uh, the leather production as a whole, then it, it comes out that uh, carbon consumption and carbon release is almost same. That is the carbon dioxide balance or, or carbon dioxide footprint, carbon footprint, we are not so bad. Now, uh, there has been an emphasis on uh, chemicals also. He has emphasized on chemicals also, but uh, now the chemical industry has a shift, uh, has made a paradigm shift and they make them the chemicals as neutral as possible as harmless as possible that is replacing synthetic materials with the natural materials like enzymes proteins waxes etc in that case he has also mentioned about jdahc whitelist rubrics sourcing the right product is a is a is a most one important point and uh, and we are highlighting ourselves uh, in uh, digging our own grave in saying in most of the cases that the leathers are highly water consuming but the leather is not uh, at that moment is uh, is highly water consuming 
it uh, if you look at the other side uh, the total uh, matrix of uh, different uh, production leather will not be as as bad as it is uh, image as as we image it now uh, regarding uh, the raw material consumption perhaps uh, tanning industry is the only industry where the utilization of only 30 to 40 percent of raw material uh, makes it survive makes it to survive so far and really 60 to 70 percent of the raw material are wasted in uh, many different form like fleshing shaving and uh, trimming etc etc but there are scopes for uh, protein upcycling and there are scopes using cell biology to develop something like uh, the like injectable protein collagen or like uh, uh, other uh, value added collagens uh, of uh, different use in that case it reminds me that if you go to europe you will not find a shampoo you will not find a soap which doesn't have a collagen as a material now uh, this uh, thing has to be looked into he has also described that the carbon footprint is going to be next key performance indicator kpi and uh, he has explained the cradle to grave approach uh, and uh, the, the study made by made by uh, the colleagues uh, in uh, in uh, europe and where we can see that the 100 percent of cow you know cow weight is uh, producing almost 80 80 percent of milk and 12 percent of goes to body weight out of the 12 percent body of 96.5 percent is used as meat and only three percent of height that is uh, carbon uh, carbon equivalent is uh, almost 0.42 percent of cow and uh, therefore if uh, there is uh, there is 70 percent of byproduct is allocated for upcycling he has also uh, distinguished between uh, bio-based origin and biodegradable material and the four different principle uh, principally different segment in it different uh, four quadrants i would say in it one is the bio-based polymers like uh, collagen cotton vegetable tan retan and etc and and uh, lecithin oils etc which are bio-based polymers and also biodegradable bio-based plastics like ca eco pud or pe non-biodegradable like polyethylene pvc and pu biodegradable plastics like pct pvat and pvs and uh, uh, he said uh, uh, time and again he has re-emphasized what I as my favorite quote that tanners were painted by a thicker brass than they deserve. Coming to the second uh, speaker, Mr. Rafi, Safi Ahmed, who is a very experienced uh, uh, person uh, in the in the tanning industry and respected man. He has uh, highlighted in the context of India how to differentiate between leather and imitation is a big uh, challenge. And the thumb rule there can be, the, one of the more major important factor can be to, to stay on or to emphasize on the eco-sustainability. And uh, in the Europe uh, or in Western countries, most of the top brands have joined to hand uh, together in uh, bringing in the awareness uh, and, uh, and and uh, and to catch up the position by product circular processing and and also circular economic now a lack of notion and awareness is as identified as one of the factor in in, in the context of india so he has a uh, he has asked for preparing a fact sheet and this fact sheet has to be widely publicized not only by a research institute or industry but by everybody associated with the leather. Branding of leather in India is a big challenge and uh, if that can be done, and uh, in that case, we also need a legislature decree that uh, the leather uh, can not be used for, uh, for a material which is made from non-animal origin. And this, uh, this misuse of leather has to be restricted, has been restricted in Europe. So the awareness of the law is the need of the hour but uh, we have uh, an advantage of we are historically important uh, leather segment uh, and uh, from the price point of view indian leather industry is gradually been marginalized by the invasion aggressive invasion of the um, you know the imitations it has a, a symbolic uh, marking and and that can that can only be uh, only be confronted if we can fight together 
to bring the awareness among the consumer and to bring the awareness about the about the wrong notion or the wrong information that is uh, floating in the floating in the mind of the people that is the image of the people how to clean our image uh, instead of cleaning the tannery the cleaning the image is also very important as he said the right of use of uh, leather uh, whether for retail or export that has to be differentiated and how are we going to make what are, the, are going to be the action plan and how are we going to protect the tanneries which are uh, some of which are uh, sometimes uh, you know going doing bad we are growing economy and we have a growing purchase uh, purchasing economy therefore and misinformation a misinformed or wrong notion or wrong image or bad image is going to be overcome only if we can highlight the sustainability of the leather to the people sustainability as well as durability and health consciousness dr kj siram thereafter the third speaker um, also is the director of the clri at present he has clarified uh, the how the certification of the leather and in the present context and what is there in the in the rest of the industry and how do we define fiber is a morphological character fineness length cross length is to cross sectional area this could be man made natural but natural resources are limited he has also emphatically mentioned that as per is iso i 15115 to 2019 it has clearly mentioned that hides and skins with its origin, original fiber structure has to be there, they are more or less in the product if that has to be qualified as a leather. The surface coating or the surface layer should not be less, should be less than 0 0.15 uh, micrometer. EU 80% uh, in Euro, uh, European Union, 80% of the surface area are upper, they are, they, they, they are, that must be leather and uh, the leather mark has been already established by uh, the government approved agencies of uk italy china brazil usa japan and uh, spain and many other countries india has to catch up and what is uh, what is the concern of all of us is uh, to aim simultaneously at the end user is it the fact that uh, they believe uh, that the synthetic is better than the better substance than the leather is it a fact that they are uh, going for synthetic because of its uh, price advantage because it is cheap cheaper that needs a kind of a market uh, survey and and a survey of the consumer behavior the real leather is a real sustainable leather it is really sustainable and we are in the in the era of uh, circular economy. <clears throat> India, on its own right and merit, probably is the first country which use, uh, used the uh, enzyme in leather production. We know it uh, uh, very well. Uh, putrid soak and you know these things are long used. <laughs> we have the first uh, country to recognize that sodium chloride uh, probably is the buzzword for uh, TDS uh, in India and uh, the the main problem is that and the leather uh, the synthetic uh, material uh, marketing also emphasizes that synthetic footwear is uh, green uh, is belongs to the green category and this concept has came from the notion that while leather is in a red category synthetic is given in a green category in india and one of the reason for this is uh, the h2 consumption which is basically what we picture, what we figure out, is basically a, a overweighted, uh, uh, is basically biased and exaggerated figures. This is actually not true. He has also emphatically mentioned <coughs> that we have to understand basically, and we have to spread this news basically, that chrome is non-toxic. Yes, it is so because uh, because of the fact that we need chrome 3 day, daily dietary intake for our lipid and glucose metabolism at the rate of 1 mg of chrome 3 per kg of the body weight and that can come only from the dietary intake 
otherwise glucose and lipid metabolism are going to be affected the chrome is much needed it is a needed material trace material for though but it is needed material it is not that it is toxic it is poison and uh, he also urged uh, that uh, for the tanning of the leather sector uh, i also feel so i am at one with uh, dr siram that we must uh, consider ourselves uh, all the segment of the leather industry must consider ourselves in a big melting pot and we must uh, we must uh, make a comprehensive plan sustainable plan uh, not in a fragmented way but in a, in a overall holistic way we must see into it and see how we can be sustainable that's uh, the main point which uh, which uh, came up to my mind to make a moderation i will now open uh, this for questions there were three hand raised three hands were raised during the question and i'll first take up the hand raised persons and i will ask uh, uh, mr pulak mojumdar to kindly unmute yourself and uh, start your video first you tell us uh, introduce you and also then you tell us your question is aimed to whom the first speaker ticket man take mayor or uh, mr safi ahmed or mr siram dr siram uh pulak majumdar please uh, unmute yourself pulak uh, uh, are you listening yeah we are listening yes 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 uh, this uh, 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 my question to mr siram uh, this process of making hallmark how long it will take because uh, the way he is explaining bias mark lot of things are there leather that's my question how long it will take to have a leather mark what is the what is the time period we are thinking the bureau of indian standards generally takes anywhere from 6 months to 12 months to recognize this and uh, appreciate uh, allow it as a marking so that's a time period that we are talking about thank you then i will uh, invite mr alokesh ray who has raised the hand alokesh ray please unmute yourself and and uh, and ask the questions first you tell to whom you want to ask the first speaker second speaker or the third speaker please unmute yourself and ask the question uh, yes are you able to listen to me yes yes uh, my question to mr shiram uh, it was a very good suggestion the first the uh, i i feel and uh, what you also repeat the same thing and i think everybody is uh, ag- will be agreed the public awareness that uh, leather uh, is um, cheaper uh, in the sense because of the sustainability and uh, leather is not detrimental to health or many other many other uh, socio religious economical aspects are there for which leather people sometimes avoid leather so what should be the ways or means uh, simply seminar or uh, in the paper it will not solve the problem so what should be the ways and means uh, to upgrade the social thought or to influence the social thinking that leather is uh, good for people and good uh, for health and good to use in every sense thank you you need the best of the scientific campaigners for this that's a simple answer that i can say all the organizations all the people associated with leather have to stand together make sure that we are in a positive outlook and we don't cut things down to create a negative image for ourselves you must understand at this point that when we go into a campaign mode even one person wrong among 100 can spoil the whole thing so we need to stand out and make sure that the industry as was mentioned the lwg etc is showcasing us in the best of the format and this should be shown out as a, a, a across all the brochures across everything that we come out with that is the only way forward okay now i am uh, asking uh, mr oh, doctor Tarak. i have i'm sh- hello i'm shafiq here i have one suggestion to add to dr sriram yes oh. yes 
Can you take it? Can you take it from me, please? Yeah. 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 yeah please go ahead, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, Doctor uh, Doctor Sriram, when you said uh, the hallmark, hallmark should also be a question of spreading the goodness of leather, because there is there is a marking today for coffee, for organic cotton, for fair trade practices. Everything is labeled today for anything, for for right from cotton to any fair trade practices or all that. So the hallmark that we are, the, sorry, the leather mark that we are talking about should also include the, the processing, processing of the leather, the eco-sustainability of the leather, the circular economy, this should be also highlighted along with the leather mark, sir. That's what we should think about, a holistic, a holistic uh, awareness of leather. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Tarak Shah is the is the person who has raised the hand. Tarak Shah, could you uh, ask the question? First, you tell us to whom you want to ask the question, and then uh, ask the question. Tarak Tarak Shah. Tarak Shah, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, uh, I don't have. We don't have any other uh, raising hand. I will go to these chairs and I will take up only if there is some questions, if there is certain things which are remarks or opinion, I'm not taking up that one. So for example, good evening, or, uh, it was a good experience, uh, highly informative, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for participation from USA, very informative. We need worldwide awareness, etc. Very true, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Tegmeyer for the excellent presentation. I feel it is to start and continue in India and Bangladesh together. We need public awareness. Yes, there is no question at all. It are all opinion that has been expressed in 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 a, in a form of a chat, and therefore, oh, uh, from my side, I have uh, no uh, duty or assignment left. Over uh, to Subir. Uh, Dr. Budhadev. Uh, yes. Uh, Dr. Tekmer. Yes. Uh, Dr. Tekmer, how do we go about this entire carbon footprinting as a procedure so that everybody follows the same methodology for evaluating it. Today you have several, the biodegradability itself, people look at it. Several people gave several methods in the same way you, when we go back to the literature, the carbon footprint assessment also is being done by people in different, different formats. How do we normalize this first? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, <clears throat> Actually, uh, in, in the automotive companies here in, in Germany, at least BMW, Mercedes-Benz, you know, I know they, um, they are taking this KPI very serious right now. Actually, the purchasing managers, their bonus system is linked to the amount of uh, carbon footprint what they purchase. <laughs> yeah. And they are asked to minimize this. And even here we have these discussions that um, these KPIs at Mercedes-Benz and, uh, um, and BMW are not um, calculated in that way, you know. And actually every brand and every OEM can uh, define what, what for, uh, for his purpose is the right KPI. There is no, um, <coughs> no rule, therefore it is very, um, very difficult that and, and be careful you have to be very careful that you are not um, <coughs> um, comp comparing apples with oranges you know so this european approach what i uh, what i have shown this is something um, you can recommend yeah and you, hopefully you can convince your customer that he is using this or um, you as an institute mm -hmm. there is a reference i um I, uh, in my presentation, yeah, there is um, an official, uh, um, yeah, this is an official publication from the European Commission, yeah. We also want to make a CEN norm out of it, uh, but it isn't so far, but um, this is an official publication of a, um, of a study and uh, it's a um, product environmental footprint category rules, PEFCR. And, EU. and then you can download this from the Cotons. Uh, this is a European uh, leather association. Um, so I only can recommend to use this, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, 
there, there is um, nothing um, um, else what we can do. ISO, uh, ISO actually says we have to minimize um, the carbon footprint contribution out of um, 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 processes uh, uh, coming from from the fore end, yeah, like the farming industry in our case, you know. Uh, but there are no clear numbers and no clear guidelines what ISO uh, 14,000 and something is giving, you know. So um, this is an official study from the EU, which you can take as a reference. I also would take it as a scientific reference. Yeah, um, it's, You can also have a look at it. These are, as I said, uh, you can download this. this are, I can also send you the link if you want. Uh, these are 150 or 60 pages, yeah, very, very long and very, very detailed. But the essence is actually that chart what I have shown today. Yeah. So again, yeah, there are no uh, um, no no clear uh, um, rules and laws. You know, these are just recommendations. And to me, as I said, um, the story is still um, not finished. You know, the problem is not only with leather. As I said, it's with all uh, raw material, uh, all materials where the raw material comes from an, a natural origin, soya or palm oil or, or whatever, you know, you do not know where to set the boundaries, you know, yeah, uh, it is, it could be endless, yeah, and, um, and for a natural raw material, these standard calculations of category rules are a disadvantage. And it can't be true that a sustainable raw material gets a disadvantage in this new economy. Therefore, I believe the arguments are on our side. Yeah, we, we have to push and we have to push and we have to push and we have to speak with one voice. Yeah, And uh, um, yes, this European uh, um, study is a good reference. Yeah. But uh, I can't. Um, I can't tell you uh, uh, what is this, if, if there is a normalized uh, standard in two or three years. Yeah, that everyone is taking the same. I, I can't tell you. Uh, Dr. Siram, uh, will you please permit me to share my experience on the carbon footprint experiment that has been done in Calcutta Leather Complex? Yeah. Well, please, please. So, sir, uh, we used uh, two instruments, uh, that is total organic carbon and uh, CHN analyzer. And we have taken uh, all kind of uh, carbon inputs into the leather with the raw material carbon content, uh, total carbon content, and then the inputs in coming in the form of uh, various chemicals uh, from starting from the uh, beam house to finishing all the chemicals uh, we have taken it. And also we have taken out the carbon content in the uh, uh, sludge, in the, in the waste uh, water, as well as the solids, uh, the biodegradable solids, uh, that 70% uh, of the, you know, these uh, solids which are wasted for three different kind of tanneries who are producing number one, club leather, number two, upper leather, and number three, uh, bag leather in Calcutta leather complex. And to my utter surprise, we found that the, as Dr. Tegmar has said, that in leather processing also, if we do not take the farmhouse uh, carbon uh, the carbon footprint into consideration, in leather processing also, the total carbon input balances with the total carbon output, and carbon is directly uh, directly you know co equivalently correlated with carbon dioxide, and and that's uh, that's my. Uh, you know, idea that came in mind, and this was published in JSLTC. Now, if we have nothing, uh, I would hand over uh, to Subir. Yeah, Subir so uh, have some internet problems, so I should start now. Thank you, Dr. Bhutudev Chairerji. To give vote of thanks, uh, honorable speaker present today, president of our association, honorable Moderator, uh, Coordinator, seen. Seminar Committee, our members, uh, and participants of participation from <coughs> India and abroad. Seminar Committee of ILTA organized this seminar to address some of the most burning issues of leather industry and society as a whole. 
it is most successfully organized and the credit goes to the seminar committee this is just a beginning we will continue us this issue to knock the appropriate authority and to enhance the awareness of the common people towards ecological impact of imitation sub leather today all the three deliberations were extremely useful informative and aimed at fulfilling our objectives so what you understood legislation for hallmarking and awareness of the people are the two most important issues we should address on top priority we will work on these two issues in near future we are grateful to the honorable speakers dr tegmeyer mr shofi gamet dr shriram for with success we are also grateful to the honorable moderator of today's seminar dr buddhadev chattopadhyay for his kind consent to conduct the panel discussion moderation and question and session just to inform you under human resource development activities we have three committees hr seminar and welfare headed by mr ratan choudhury subir datto and kosik bhuiya those are working very hard and prepared a road map of the series of events which includes seminars workshops training medical camps etc in coming days on digital platform we need your whole hearted support in all our future activities lastly we express our sincere thanks to all participants from india and abroad for showing your keen interest and giving us the motivation to go ahead with such activities thank you very much